We are going to preach the gospel to all who want to hear a message of salvation unto the meek we bear. Jehovah has commanded us, and therefore we must go. For none do preach the gospel like the Mormons do, like the Mormons do. How to obtain the Spirit, it's the next thing that we say. As in the days of Peter, the same as in our day. Tis by the laying on of hands, as, we, as the scriptures plainly show. For none do preach the gospel like the Mormons do, like the Mormons do. Read the 12th of 1 Corinthians, Ephesians 4 and 2, and the 16th of Mark's Gospel, and that will prove to you that Mormonism is scriptural as well as it is true. For none do preach the gospel like the Mormons do, like the Mormons do. They just told me that I better watch my P's and Q's. Must be a pretty highfalutin crowd here tonight. I don't know why they worry about me so much. I say the same thing everybody else says. Apostle Ballard gets up and he says, Brethren and sisters, I haven't prepared a sermon today. What I'm going to say, the Lord alone knows. <laughs> yeah, he'll preach him a fine sermon, too. Well, I get up and I say the same thing. Brothers and sisters, God only knows what I'm going to say to you. <laughs> well, see, they all laugh. Because of that, President Grant has asked me to write out all of my sermons these days. Of course, I have my discourse right here in my pocket. You know, he told me I had to write it. He didn't tell me I had to read it, so I won't. Are there any reporters here tonight? I'm always afraid of these reporters. They get things down just as I say it. <laughs> I'm not highly cultured, and for me to be my natural self has proven somewhat dangerous. Well, this is a pretty nice setup here. Wish I had some of this in my own living room. Well, I'm not going to announce any blood and thunder doctrine to you brothers and sisters here tonight. I've not been radical since I came very near to being operated on, thought I was going to die. People come up to me, they said, why, Golden, you needn't be afraid, you'll get justice. That is exactly what I'm afraid of. I'm old enough to know a thing or two. I'm here to pass it on so some of you don't have to travel the same rock of ground as I did. If you don't like what I have to say, well, you can surely go to sleep <laughs> like you do in church. We'll wake you up when it's time to go home. Well, let me get a look at you. Looking over you, I do not discover that you are very distinguished in appearance. <laughs> Why, well, you're no better looking than I am, and I look pretty bad. We wouldn't take a very good picture, would we? Thank goodness the Lord don't judge on appearance. We'd all be damned. <laughs> well, I guess I can tell you my whole life's history in about five minutes flat, leaving out the bad parts of it. <laughs> my whole name is Jonathan Golden Kimball. Most people just call me Golden. I am one of the polygamous sons of Heber C. Kimball. Forty-six sons and not a bastard among them. Seventeen daughters and forty-six sons out of sixteen wives. Quite an accomplishment. 
Father never really told me how many wives he had. Mother said he never really mentioned it to her either. <laughs> I was born in these valleys up there in Salt Lake City, up on Capitol Hill, six years after the pioneers arrived. Father died when I was 15. For the next 12 years, I was free as the birds that fly in the air. There was no restraint further than the counsel from my mother. I presume the following description given on me when I was young is pretty true. He shall have strong mental powers and be stupid in his own way. <laughs> That's a part of my history I'm not making much noise about. I'm trying to forget some of the things I've done. But nothing criminal, of course. But it was a well-known fact that you didn't fool with the Kimball boys. Why, I believe we were the terror of Salt Lake City. Hush, boys. We used to meet up in the 18th Ward block. We had a brother who was somewhat of a general, trained all of us boys. That is, when my father was away. He'd get us out there behind the barn. He'd put a chip on one of our shoulders. Then he would tell somebody to knock it off, and then we would fight. <laughs> when we asked our brother why he did this to us, he said, why, it'll make you talk. Well, my father had a wonderful garden, lots of fruit and vegetables. Told us boys we couldn't have any of the fruit. To prove it, he fenced it in by an eight-foot wall. We got it anyhow. <laughs> boys do, you know. This same brother, the general, He'd take one of the boys and dangle him over the wall on a piece of rope, you see, so he could load up his shirt, bosom, and pockets full of apples. Well, one day, Brother Tucker, the gardener, caught him holding the rope and took after him with a willow. I mean, he laid into him. He really lambasted him. Well, when it was all over, I went up to my brother, who was feeling pretty bad, and I said, Cheer up, brother. It'll make you talk. <laughs> Already in trouble at a young age, too. <laughs> oh, it'll make you talk. Well, so I grew up in Salt Lake City. I've known that town all my life. It's not safe anymore. I just as soon think of putting my doctors into a den of lions as to send them to Salt Lake City. There's no people in this world where there's more laxity and freedom given to children than among the Latter-day Saints. I think we ought to feed them a raw meat, cayenne, pepper, and green cactus diet. That would stiffen up their backbones. I remember being in a far-off settlement not long ago for conference where they see few or any of the leading brethren. There was a great many young people there. When I retired at night, I was kept awake all night long by the boys and girls out running the streets. Well, I got up toward morning, looked at my watch. They were still out roaming the streets. It was 4.30. I spoke to the state president about the next day, and he said, why, well, yes, we have some problems, all right. What with the boys toting guns, etc." Guns? Well, I thought maybe it's time to get their attention. Go to hell. <laughs> Go to hell! That's where you're going anyway if you don't quit your damn foolishness. I heard last night you were all going around toting six shooters in your hip pockets. Well, you better watch out. Damn things will go off and blow your brains out. <laughs> oh, I've given up cussing entirely, you know. <laughs> At least the way I used to. 
When I get up there, I don't intend to use those words. They just come out. Leftovers from my cowboy days used to be my native language. <laughs> and I can assure you they are leftovers from a far larger vocabulary. <laughs> well, you can't drive mules if you can't swear. It's the only language they understand. Now Noah got two of them cold, sworn, ornery critters aboard his ark at the same time. It's a mystery to me. I never seen a mule much as wiggle his ear unless he heard a few cuss words. Now when I stand up there, I don't mean to use those words. Brothers and sisters, my mind works in kind of a motion picture fashion. Ideas come to me rapidly, one after the other. I'm not thinking about those words then. <laughs> There they are. <laughs> well, everybody's got some weakness. Mine's just a little more conspicuous. <laughs> Why? Uh, even President Grant swears. It's true. Say it isn't true. I heard him. We went down to St. George together. It was summertime and it was hot. Crops were perishing for want to water. The people were starving. There was dead and dying cattle. I looked out over this terrible drought and I said, damn shame, isn't it Heber? And Heber said, yes, it is. When father died, the family, well, they all divided up. We went up to Bear Lake country, commenced a fight for life. God knows it was a hard fight. Poverty, terrible blizzards in the winter. Some years seemed like we had nine months of winter and three months of late fall. <laughs> Nothing grew. But still we survived, my brother Elias and I, my sister Mary, and my dear mother, Christine Golden. Well, strange part of it was we never got discouraged, hadn't enough sense to know when we'd failed, I guess. But we had to hustle to earn a living. That's how I became a hustler. Got in with some cowboys and mule skinners and loggers and the like. Went very quickly down the road to hell, I did. Well, it seems like I've seen some of you on that road too now, haven't I? <laughs> One winter, call came for volunteers. Go up the canyon and help cut logs for the Logan Temple. Well, I was about 25 years old at the time. What else you gonna do up there in Bear Lake Country, 25 years old, middle of winter? So we went, we all went, worked in snow up to the waist, temperature 10 to 40 below. When we'd returned to camp at night, our clothes was froze, stiff as a board from the waist down. Nobody got paid. Nobody even caught a cold. You read something into that? Good, you should. One day, C.O. Card, who ran the camp, gave me one of the worst jobs I ever had. He said, Golden, I want you to take charge of this here camp. Well, that didn't seem so hard. Then he told me my job was I had to get them all to pray every morning and every evening. And I was to choose a different man every time and we was to entirely stop cussing at all. Well, some of those prayers were downright funny, but I know the Lord heard every one of them. But to cut out the swearing? Well, I thought about it and thought about it. Finally, I determined, you know, if I could just get me and George to stop. Now, George, 
He was a champion cusser of all time. He swore so perfectly, made such a science out of it, I never thought he needed an ax to chop down them trees. <laughs> He'd just rear back, let out a jagged string of them words, the trees would gladly fall over. Well, I made my way around the canyon where he was chopping. We stood there four feet deep in snow, way below zero. I said, George, um, you got to stop your swearing. That's orders. Well, now I know, I know. No, 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 no. Hang on just a minute, George. We got to stop all of us. That's my orders. Stop. I've quit already, George, and damn it if I can, you sure as hell can. <laughs> well, you know, or the whole camp fell in line when George did. It was astonishing. Joe Morris was up there with us. He was the best man with oxen I ever saw. One day, we was hauling some of them temple logs down the sawmill. He turned the whip over to me. Go ahead, can't learn any younger. There were six yoke. I'd never tackled half so many. Well, I took the whip, started in. <clears throat> ha! Those oxen, dumb as they were, knew a change had been made. you. Ha! Joe just stood there and laughed at me. Ha! Ha! They lagged and some of them turned around and looked at me. I fancied they was all laughing at my shrill voice. respectable to those oxen for some time, but what good did it do? Then I started into cussing. It was after the manifesto on swearing too, but I was mad I had to turn loose. Boy, how I did cuss. Did I wax eloquent? I'm afraid I did. But did those oxen sit up and take notice? They surely did, you see. Those were church oxen. When you talked that language to them, they understood it. <laughs> well, you can see a training like that sort of kicks hell out of you. <laughs> Makes a man tough as a pine knot. But I wasn't meant to be a pine knot for long, at least not in that condition. For an event occurred to me that's changed my life from that day to this has impressed me with a feeling which can never be blotted out. That night up there in Bear Lake, we went into a log meeting house and heard a short, stout man with a thick German accent talk about education and the gospel. I shall never forget it. Well, never remembered exactly what he said, but <laughs> something hit me that night. I knew that there was more to life than I had. That man proved to be Brother Carl G. Major. Well, my brother and my mother and I then made as great a sacrifice as I've ever seen to move to Provo. so I could attend the Brigham Young Academy, go to college. For the next two years, I studied under Brother Mazur. Then one day, it was the spring 1883, I had a petition, you see, for Salt Lake City to grade the streets. I went into President Taylor's office to obtain a signature, and Brother William Spence was there. He said, oh, Brother Kimball, President Taylor sent you a letter calling you on a mission. He's very disturbed you've not answered it. I said, how could I answer his letter if I never got it? 
Well, he said, you better go in and talk to him about it. Right now? Like this? Well, if you say so. <laughs> President Taylor, sir. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kimball, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, one of 46 sons and not a bastard. Bad, bad one among them. <laughs> yes. First time I've been in this office since father died. Yes. 15 years. He was a great man. Well, I loved him too. Well, Brother Spence mentioned that. Well, how could I answer your letter if I never got it? You sure that's what the Lord wants? Well, no, I guess if you didn't know, no one else would. I'll give you my answer in one hour, sir. Brother President Taylor, sir, I'd been praying to the Lord. I'd been asking him why I was not called. All of my friends had been called, still I was not. Well, I went down on the street. First man I run into was Bishop Jenkins, been up there in Bear Lake with us. Bishop, Bishop! I've just been called on a mission. Well, don't act so surprised. <laughs> Brother Jenkins, will you sign my note at the bank? You bet. So I put $100 in my pocket, and I went on a mission to the southern states. <sighs> I had a terrible time. <laughs> when I think about it now, I actually shudder. In the South, the elders were hounded, hunted, whipped, shot at. Some were killed. But I can look you in the face and tell you, that was the happiest time all of my life. <laughs> That's what you get for being in the service of the Lord. Well, anyways, we got on that train, 27 elders, farmers, cowboys, you educated, pretty hard-looking crowd, me included. We was on our way to meet President B.H. Roberts, president of the Tennessee Conference. Well, the elders, they started in singing, preaching, advertised pretty loudly, teaching, and calling as their missionaries. You know how they are. For once in my life, I kept pretty quiet. Silence is golden. <laughs> I hardly opened my mouth till I heard some men asking each other the destination. One of them said, oh, I think I'll go north to escape the Mormons. Another said, I think I'll go south to escape the Mormons. Another said, I feel I'll go east to escape the Mormons. Well, something welled up inside of me, and I said, why don't you go to hell? For I know there are no Mormons there. <laughs> well, that's how missionaries feel sometimes. <laughs> Another gentleman got on that train. I can visualize that man now. He knew we were as a band of Mormon elders. Well, the elders, they soon commenced an argument with the stranger. Before he was through with them, they were in grave doubt as to their message of salvation. He gave them a train, and they never forgot. That man proved to be President B.H. Roberts. 
Brother Robert sent me and the son of an apostle into the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. We walked. Oh my, how we walked. I'm a very poor walker. I ain't built for it. Some people say it's quite comical to watch me walk. That's the only way I can work at it. Now, my friends, I have been among this people for a considerable length of time. I've traveled among this people from Canada to Mexico, but never in all of my labors have I felt the thrill and flame of the Holy Spirit like I did when I was on my mission. You had to be a good missionary to survive in the South. Stalwart, strong, humble, Southern states. That's where I learned to pray with one eye open. <laughs> I can remember my companion praying. We had our eyes shut and our hands up like this. Well, I thought he'd never get through. When he finally did say, Amen, we looked back. There were four men standing behind us with guns on their shoulders. That's the last time I prayed with two eyes shut, the last time. Those people would rather hear anything but the truth. I suppose I should give you some idea of their religion, for that is what they called it. But that is a misnomer. It's simply business as usual. When we showed up because their business and trouble, oh my, how they howled and cried, choked and chortled and called us names. I remember once on passing the minister, he said, good morning, sons of the devil. I said, good morning, father. It is quite something to lay your religion on the line and travel as a stranger in a strange land. You must learn the lesson of humility. I learned my lesson in this church just as every man of you will. There's nothing I dreaded worse than laying out of doors on the ground. Now I walked hundreds, thousands of miles, but I never lay out of doors but twice. But I must confess to you, I hustled. The Lord will not help people who do not hustle and move. After they pray and do their duty, we never were at a loss to know what to do when we had the spirit of a calling. I prayed, my companion prayed. We heard that voice. Well, not very often, not as often as we should have, but we heard it say, this is the way. Walk ye in it. I'd heard that voice before. I heard it when I was wild, reckless young man. I told my brother Elias, I hear a voice. I didn't know what it meant then, but I know what it means now. When I reported to the president, Wilford Woodruff, oh, that great prophet, he said, Brother Kimball, Oh, he was so kind. He said, Brother Kimball, come right over here and sit down beside me for just a minute. We only had a few minutes. He said, Now, Brother Kimball, I've had visions, I've had revelations, and I have seen angels. But the greatest of all is that still, small voice I've heard that voice. I am a witness. I know that God lives. That's what I'm telling these young boys that are getting called on their missions now. They wasn't called by their bishops or their stake presidents. Oh, sure, they were recommended and their names properly endorsed, yet the Lord is their shepherd. Eighteen eighty four. 
It was a hard year for the church in the South. Brother Roberts called me to work with him in the mission office. I didn't want to go, but I went anyhow. 